Any serious fan of Pink Floyd will tell you that their 1975 album Wish You Were Here was inspired by their former and founding member, Sid Barrett. Sid, plagued by mental health issues and severe substance abuse, left the band in 1968. His legacy and presence would live on, however, haunting the music of Pink Floyd. Especially so for Wish You Were Here, in which Shine On You Crazy Diamond is specifically dedicated to the former member. So what is the full story of Wish You Were Here and what happened when Sid Barrett dropped in on the band while they were recording the album, the last time any of them would ever see him? Hi, I'm Adam, welcome back to Music Mongoose. Going back to that album cover, this has rightfully become one of the most poignant and striking album covers of all time. Produced by the creative team at Hypnosis, it implies volumes about the album itself. The handshake is seen to represent a hollow, empty gesture, perhaps alluding to the music industry's purely transactional reality, while the man in flames symbolises a tendency to remain emotionally withdrawn despite the excruciating burning or the fear of being burned perhaps brought on by fame and success in music. This, as many point out, could also point to Sid and his self-destructive way of life. The album explores many themes, relationships, a desire for success, but perhaps most importantly, according to the Hypnosis team, it explores the theme of absence. Perhaps the absence of camaraderie in Pink Floyd that Waters felt at the time, or the absence of decency in the music industry. The two businessmen were inspired directly by Have a Cigar, a song that made a dig at industry bods that had lost sight of the big picture in favour of making some quick money through the band. And perhaps quite simply, it's about the absence of Sid Barrett. Pink Floyd formed in 1965 in London. Roger Waters, Nick Mason, Richard Wright and Sid Barrett were the original lineup. Sid, from the beginning, was the creative mastermind of the group. He would lead the band conceptually and would be the reason for their initial success. Arnold Lane and C. Emily Play, penned by Sid, would be their earlier hits, encapsulating this unique sound and direction that Pink Floyd would become famous for. Now at this point, of course, David Gilmour hadn't become a member of the group. Gilmour was a friend of Waters and Sid and they very much respected his guitar playing ability. He wasn't in the band at this point though, and Waters was still finding his feet with songwriting, so it was Sid driving the momentum. Unfortunately, his mental state declined in those early years of the band and he became very difficult to work with. This, coupled with dangerous drug use, would make it almost impossible for him to be a coherent band member. This is where David Gilmore would come in, hired as a sort of backup for when Sid couldn't do his job. However, of course, Sid's mental state continued to decline and he separated from the band in 1968, meaning that Dave became a full member. While Sid was done with Pink Floyd, he wasn't quite done with music. In 1970, he released two solo albums, The Madcap Laughs and Barrett. And Sid had help with these two albums from his former bandmates. Wright said this, Doing Sid's record was interesting but extremely difficult. Dave and Roger did the first one, The Madcap Laughs, and Dave and myself did the second one. But by then, it was just trying to help Sid any way we could. Rather than worrying about getting the best guitar sound, you could forget about that. It was just going into the studio and trying to get him to sing. From this, you can see that Pink Floyd hadn't completely closed the door on Sid Barrett. They were very much still invested in him as a friend, as a person, and wanted to try and get him better. These albums, however, didn't quite reach the level of critical success as he'd enjoyed with Pink Floyd. Music wasn't quite working out for Sid. And it wasn't quite working for Pink Floyd either. Since Sid's departure, the band really struggled to find their sound. Forced to experiment and think way outside the box, Pink Floyd became known for their musical innovation. Light shows and soundscapes, they were becoming the experimental band. Echoes and Atom Heart Mother, two expansive and experimental pieces, would become standouts in this period. These could be seen as an attempt from Pink Floyd to find their sound after Sid had gone. Finally, five years after Sid's departure, all the pieces seemed to fall together, with 1973's Dark Side of the Moon, a stunningly poignant exploration of universal themes, madness, death, anxiety, alienation, bound together by some of the most technically advanced and fearlessly innovative musical concepts at that time. The album performed ridiculously well, commercially and critically, from the off. It actually remained on the Billboard charts for 724 weeks, the longest consecutive run for an LP ever. 
and has sold 30 million copies worldwide to date. Despite this dizzying success though, the album didn't simply give way to further success. The album's seemingly endless tours exhausted the band, both physically and creatively. The idea of writing another album, let alone a better performing album, seemed impossible. Despite this, the initial writings for Wish You Were Here started on that tour, and pretty soon Waters had a concept that eventually led to the album. So ironically, the success of Dark Side of the Moon left the band feeling lost, unsure of what comes next, unsure of how to top that album. And we come back to that idea of absence, absence of direction for the band. It was really the fallout after Dark Side of the Moon that planted the seeds that would lead to the themes of Wish You Were Here. By the time their final European tour came around, they had around three new compositions that they would hone during the final leg of the tour. According to David Gilmour, one of these was a simple four-note melodic pattern. However, Gilmour managed to find something which, in his words, evoked the indefinable, inevitable melancholy of Sid Barrett. This four-note melody would eventually become the opener and closer of the album, Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Positioning the album conceptually as a nod to Sid Barrett. Fleshing out Shine On You Crazy Diamond inspired a creative surge, and pretty soon, Mason, Waters and Gilmore were on the precipice of creating musical greatness once again. On the 5th of June 1975, while recording Wish You Were Here, Pink Floyd would be surprised to see their former bandmates and the person whom the album was in many ways inspired by, Sid Barrett. Barrett reportedly visited Abbey Road Studios while they were working on Shine On You Crazy Diamond. Now, you need to understand that at this point, Sid Barrett was no longer in the music industry. He was living in obscurity out of a London hotel. He had cut all ties with his former bandmates. So his arrival on that day was a proper shock for Pink Floyd. The person Pink Floyd saw in the studio that day was nothing like how they remembered Sid. Waters initially thought he was a staff member for EMI. When Waters realized that this bloated man with shaved eyebrows and a shaved head was in fact Barrett, it reduced him to tears. And while physically he was in the room, it was quite clear that mentally he was somewhere else. This moment reportedly led Richard Wright to include a refrain from C. Emily Play, one of Sid's first hits, at the very end of Shine On You Crazy Diamond. The group also played the track to Sid to see his reaction. Barrett said it sounded a bit old, which you can interpret how you see fit. He quietly vanished during celebrations for David Gilmour's wedding to Ginger Hassenbein, which took place later that same day. Although interestingly, if you look at this online, there seems to be some confusion as to which day Sid actually turned up at the studio. You see, Gilmour didn't marry Ginger until the 7th of July, so how could he have slipped away during wedding celebrations if the wedding hadn't taken place yet? To this day, the band, studio engineers, staff working at EMI at the time struggle to recount exactly what happened. Some say that he actually visited twice. And I think it's quite a fitting way to remember this encounter, the enigma that is Sid Barrett. He's like a ghost. The man who had such an impact on the band that even memories of him become dazed and confused. The absence of clarity, if you will. I think that's a great legacy for their final meeting. It summarises Sid's being and his influence on the band quite poetically, I think. Like a ghost, he appears and vanishes and no one can quite remember the details. It's beautiful. Roger Waters would have one final encounter with Sid. I bumped into him in Harrods, where he used to go to buy sweets, but we didn't speak. He sort of scuttled away. Sid wouldn't see any members of the band for the rest of his life. He passed away in 2006. And guess what date he passed away on? The 7th of July, the date of Gilmore's wedding. Now that's just weird, isn't it? When Wish You Were Here was released, it seemed to mark a new maturity for Pink Floyd. While its use of synthesizers and innovative sound design won the hearts of many, others deemed it as the product of a band whose creativity and passion had faded away. While not as successful as Dark Side of the Moon, I do think Wish You Were Here is more intelligent than Dark Side of the Moon. Sure, it's less accessible, but there's a poignancy to that album that I don't think Dark Side of the Moon quite reaches, especially after knowing about the history of the band and Sid Barrett. What's more, Gilmore and Wright both agree that this was probably their best album. 
I for one would have to say that it is my favourite album, the Wish You Were Here album. The end result of all that, whatever it was, definitely has left me an album I can live with very, very happily. I like it very much. For Roger Waters, however, this album, along with Animals, would signify the beginning of the end for Pink Floyd. And years of feuding between Waters and Gilmore would finally lead to Waters leaving the band. Now, another surprising encounter that happened in that very same studio for Pink Floyd was the day that they met the Beatles. And Roger Waters was disappointed when he met John Lennon. You can click the video here to find out why. <laughs> 